final topic of 101 is called graphs. So what is a graph? And this is not a graph usually in the way that you think of as a plot, as in you, you graph a function, but rather a graph is, uh, so it is a, formally speaking, it's really a mathematical object uh, that represents entities, which are usually called vertices or nodes. And relationships between pairs. So specifically between pairs, and these are often called edges. So <clears throat> it's something, it's a mathematical object that represents entities and relationships between them. And you know, the good thing about teaching about graphs, excuse me, in this day and age is that most of you know what graphs are because you know what social networks are and you know what things like Twitter are, which are examples of graphs. So the way that you would draw a graph is something like this. Like for example, you have a bunch of vertices labeled one, two, three, four, five, but the vertices could have any kind of label. And then you have something that looks like this. Now you shouldn't think of this as being drawn in the plane. This is just merely a representation of this graph. Now, this is the mathematical object. We can also think of graph as a data structure. You know, storing this mathematical object. This is Technically it's, it's, it's incorrect. I mean, the specific data structure, I will explain later, but a lot of people, when they use graph, they're often referring to the data structure that's actually storing this information. Whereas sort of mathematically speaking, there is a mathematical object and there is a data structure that stores the mathematical object. So I'm going to use a little bit of mathematical notation right now so that, you know, we could, uh, we have some terminology to talk about these things. So usually you'll see a graph is written as G is equal to a tuple V comma E. V is a set of vertices. And we will assume, unless I say otherwise, that the set of vertices is just labeled one to N. Okay. And E is a set of pairs of vertices. And these are often, these are the edges. And conventionally, this number of edges is usually denoted by M. <clears throat> so these are like the pairs. So in this case, in this graph, you have five vertices and you have the pairs one, two, two, three, one, four, one, five, two, five, and five, four. And if E is unordered, unordered, if E is unordered, then this is called an undirected graph, right? So for example, in this case, this graph is undirected. <coughs> is everyone able to see uh, what I'm writing and everything is clear? If there are any like technical problems, you should let me know before it gets too late, before uh, I end right. up like, you know, doing half the lecture. Right, that's very clear. Okay, good, good. Maybe this is even more clear than actually lecture in person. Maybe I should just do this. Why is it unordered? So, okay, what I mean by unordered is that the pair one, two, and two, one are the same. So I'll explain this in just a minute. I think if I write something more, okay. it'll be clear. So for example, friendship on Facebook. Maybe this example is dated. Maybe you guys don't use Facebook anymore. I don't know what you use. Like, is it what snap or I, I don't know. I, I, I have a niece who's, who's, who's an undergrad 
And I don't know, she tells me all these things. I have no idea what they are, but hopefully you know what friendship on Facebook is. What this means is if, if one is a friend of two, then two is the friend of one, right? Friendship is a mutual relationship, right? This is a mutual relationship. Now, if E is ordered, then this is called a directed graph. So an example of a directed graph, I'm just drawing is think of it as edges have a direction. Right. So and they only this, go one way. They only go one way. So what this is, you can think of as like followers on Twitter, right? You follow a celebrity doesn't mean that the celebrity follows you. So therefore the edge in this case, three, four, five. So here one, two and two, one are the same thing. Let me just bring this into focus, but here the pair one, two is not the same as the pair two, one. Does that make sense? Right? So in a directed graph, it could be that one is following two and two is following one, so on and so forth. So somebody asks, can two nodes have more than one edge? That's a good question. So let me, I'm just coming to that point in a second. So, so this is what a graph is. Now, nothing prevents in the definition as such, I call this a set, although you could assume that maybe you have things like this or maybe there's an edge that goes from a vertex to itself. This is called a self loop. And these are called parallel edges. So parallel edges and self loop. Okay. So a graph can have parallel edges and self loops, <coughs> although, excuse me, usually the most common graphs that we look at do not have these. And so there is a notion of what is called a simple graph. And often, unless I say so, graphs can be assumed to be simple. It means that there are no parallel edges, no self loops, which I'll also say is there are no weights on edges. Sometimes edges can have weights or distances. Like if you were to think of a road network, like actually Google actually stores the entire map as a graph and for every edge, it's a road. Mm -hmm. And so some roads are one way, some roads are two ways. So they have a mixture of a directed and undirected graph and it has weights, it's a much more complex object. But if you think about the friendship graph on Facebook, that's a simple graph because there are no parallel edges, which means that if one and five are friends, then they're friends. Like there's no need to represent that multiple times. And there is no such thing as you being a friend of yourself, although you should be a friend of yourself, but Facebook really doesn't care about that. Okay, so is this clear? Are all the definitions over here clear? Right, so this is what it means to be a graph. Let me pull this up a bit so that you can see everything here. Okay, so this is just some basics about what a graph is. Now that we have graphs, I'm gonna start giving some terminology. So most of what I'm doing here is in some sense purely mathematical. Like if you were to take a graduate textbook in graph theory, it would begin with explaining some of these things. And indeed, even though they say graduate, it's actually for those of you who are sort of mathematically inclined or interested, you know, it's, you can read a, a textbook in graph theory and there's, there's a lot of interesting things to learn there. Okay. So let's, now that we have this, let's talk a little bit more about simple graphs. Okay. So I want to sort of focus my attention on the basic case of simple undirected graphs. 
And so we have this, let's go back to uh, this example that I drew, maybe one, two, three, four, five, put this other vertex here, six. Okay, so maybe this is my graph. Note that I have this vertex over here all by itself. So let's say V is a vertex. NV is the neighborhood of V. So the neighborhood of V is the set of vertices U such that UV is an edge. So for example, the neighborhood of one is two, four, three, right? Is a set which I'll just sort of say two, three, four, which is the same as the set two, four, three, right? The ordering doesn't matter. It's just a set of vertices. The neighborhood of two is one, five, and four. <clears throat> okay. The neighborhood of six is what? I want to type it in chat. What is the neighborhood of six? Exactly, right? It's the empty set. And these are called isolated vertices. Okay, so, so this is an undirected graph. It's an undirected graph. So now let me ask you a question. And uh, I will actually, I'll launch a poll where you can answer. So this is an undirected graph. So if U is in NV, then is V in NU? Question. So the option A is yes. The option B is no. The option C is, I don't understand what this question means. Okay. So I'm going to launch a poll right now and give you a few minutes to answer the poll. All right, there you go. So you should see option A is yes. Option B is no. Option C is, I don't understand the question. So don't worry, I'll switch the options so that at some point A is I don't understand, not always C. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so at least... Uh, <clears throat> So it does seem that at least, you know, about three fourths of the people who've answered about a third of you, uh, two thirds of you seem to get the answer. And someone said in the chat, doesn't it depend if it's directed or not exactly, but that's why I said, if it's an undirected graph, I'm looking at undirected graphs here. And so in an undirected graph, the answer is yes, right? In an undirected graph. So I'm assuming the graph is undirected. If U is in NV, then V is in NU, because if U is a neighbor of V, then V is a neighbor of U. That's what it means to be undirected. Okay, so this is basically a little description, a mathematical description of what a graph looks like. So what is a graph? It's simply, you can think of it as for every vertex, you have a collection of sets, which are the neighbors. And if they satisfy this condition here, which is if U is in NV, then N is in VU, then this is an undirected graph. Now, another important notion when you have graphs is a notion called the degree. This is the degree of V. This is the size of the set NV. This is the number of neighbors 
of V, degree. The, the degree is how many friends do you have? How many friends do you have? And there's an interesting thing about degrees, which I'll mention is it's called the friendship paradox. It's actually a mathematical statement. It says that the average degree of your neighbor is often higher than your own degree. This is a very interesting thing. So let me say this again, and then you ask me questions if this, if this makes sense. The average degree of your, it's not obvious to prove, and I, can, I don't want to prove it, get into it, but I just want to tell you something about degrees. This is called the friendship paradox, which what this means is most people think that they're unpopular because they have popular friends. So what does it mean to be popular? It means you have high degree. And the friendship paradox says that for most vertices, most of their neighbors will often have higher degree than them. So it's kind of like, uh, and so everybody thinks that they're unpopular, but actually it's just, it's sort of just a mathematical uh, issue. So typically, yeah, so someone says your friends always have more friends than you. And that's because essentially most of us will have some popular friends. And we look at those popular people and think that, oh my God, look, most people have more friends than we do. But it's basically, uh, it's kind of like almost a, a math, uh, uh, just a mathematical certainty that that will happen. Okay, so just to complete this discussion of degree in neighborhoods, if one is looking at a directed graph, then you have two kinds of neighborhoods. You have something called an out neighborhood. And you have something called an in neighborhood. Right? Right? Because you have, there are two kinds of edges at a vertex V. These are the out neighbors and these are the in neighbors, right? So this is the in neighborhood and the out neighborhood. And often we will denote that by a subscript, which is a plus or a minus, like a plus or a minus. Okay, to denote the out neighborhood or the in neighborhood. Okay, so this is essentially the discussion of degree. I don't know if anybody noticed. Maybe, maybe I'm just uh, I'm just so picky about it. I think my handwriting is a lot better, and that's actually I think because this is my office and I can set the table to be exactly the right height where my where uh, you know for my for my hand. And whereas um, the document camera there, I think the, the height isn't perfect for my writing. But anyway, so <clears throat> ignoring, uh, ignoring uh, that. So that's what, so we have this discussion of in a graph, you have a notion of a neighborhood. You have a notion of out neighborhoods and in neighborhoods in a directed graph. And you have a concept of degree. Just as you have degree, you could have like in degree and out degree as well. <clears throat> so now that we have this mathematical object and there's a lot, lots and lots of data represented as graphs. So actually the study of graphs and the application of graph algorithms is probably one of the most important topics in computer science these days because graph data is so prevalent in a lot of what happens uh, in our world. Okay, so a natural question is to ask, this is a data structure question, is how to represent a graph. That is, how do you represent it in your computer? And I wanna make a slight distinction so typically when you have data structures, you're thinking about the time it takes to insert, delete, or find. Often data structures change over time. And that's sort of the point of data structures. Often with graphs, we kind of think a little bit about static graphs. So graphs may change over time. But we often process fixed graphs. 
So I'll explain. The best way to think of this is Google Maps, right? So Google Maps has one map network. Now, does the map network change over time? Sure. Every now and then, roads are built, certain roads break down, certain things change. But if you think about it, those changes don't happen very often. What happens far more often on Google Maps is people are asking for directions. So you have a fixed graph where people want to process and find information on the graph. And that changes a little bit about how you think about the representation. So you're not worried so much about inserting and deleting edges. You're worried a lot more about what's called traversing the graph or processing the graph to answer things about, for example, distance. Okay. So having said that, I want to discuss three very classic ways of representing a graph. And let me start by maybe seemingly like the most stupidest representation, which is just a list of edges. So what you could have is you simply have a list of pairs. U1, V1, U2, V2, so on and so forth. Okay. So N is the number of vertices. M is the number of edges. Question, how much storage? So how much storage in a raw list of edges? Is it theta of N? Is it theta of M? Is it theta of N plus M? I'll go ahead and launch the poll. How much storage, if I'm storing this simply as a list of edges? <clears throat> Wait, so just to confirm, like an edge is like denoted as like one comma two, right? Exactly. It's just denoted as a pair. So if you were to think, it's convenient to think of each vertex, maybe it's just stored as like a long or an int, right? And an edge is like just a pair. Okay, that makes sense. Right? So you're just storing a collection of pairs. It's, it's, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so it seems that the majority of you have got the answer, but maybe not a, not a full majority as much as I would have, uh, as much as I would have liked. So I think there's still some confusion on this question. The answer is O of M. So why is it O of M? Because, you know, it's essentially for every edge, you're storing some constant amount of memory. It is not O of N because it doesn't care about vert. So for example, if you had a graph where you had lots of isolated vertices, N would be large and M would be small, but there is no N in this. It's only M. It's just a unit of memory for every pair of edges, right? So this is in some sense the simplest method and surprisingly enough, and I can talk about this later if you have questions, that this is still used in certain cases because it is so convenient. But if you think about it, it kind of like has nothing to do with the graph. It doesn't seem to represent anything about the relationships in a meaningful way. And so really something that represents the relationships in a better way, the first, classic example is called an adjacency matrix. So what is an adjacency matrix? We're going to represent a graph as a matrix A. And we'll just say that A of UV. So if I look at, there's an entry, there's a row for U and a column for V. I'll say A of UV is one if UV is an edge and it's zero otherwise. So if there is an edge here, I'm going to put a one. Otherwise, I put a zero. So if I look at U's row, 
I can read out who are all the neighbors. It's almost like a bitmap in some sense. It's a bitmap of all possible edges. It's another way of thinking of it. Okay. Now, if G is undirected, then this matrix is its transpose. I hope this makes sense. A transpose is if you flip, if you flip this uh, matrix on its diagonal, you're going to get the same graph because if it's undirected, UV and VU are going to have the same entries, right? So if you have an entry over here for some U prime V prime, you can correspondingly look at U prime there and V prime here. And you'll get exactly the same thing. Whatever is here is going to be over here, right? Because essentially it's symmetric. Okay. Does this make sense? This is an adjacency matrix. So you're storing all the, you're storing edges as a bitmap. Okay. Now, naturally the question is how much storage I think about this carefully, how much storage does an adjacency matrix use? So is it theta of M? Is it theta of N log N? Or is it theta of N squared? Okay. And I'll launch a poll. <clears throat> How much storage does it use? I think about this carefully. Is it M? Is it N log N or is it N squared? Can you re-explain what like the U prime and the V prime ones again? So this is just look, I'm just saying that um I'm trying to explain that why if a graph is undirected, then A transpose is equal to A. So I'm saying if you just took two vertices U prime V prime and you look at the entry, so if you look at this entry, A U prime V prime, this is going to be equal to A V prime U prime if the graph is undirected, right? And this is the same thing as saying that the transpose is the same. So I'm just saying uh, that the matrix concept of transpose is essentially saying like the graph is undirected. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Okay, so it seems that there's a, a, a little bit more confusion on this point. This is maybe a trickier question. So the answer is it's theta n squared because you're storing one bit for every pair u comma v. Like for every possible pair, you have to store a bit. You're storing an entire matrix. Right. So if there, if it's an N cross N matrix, right? So this is, there are N things here and there are N things here. The size of the matrix, the size of the matrix is N squared. There are N squared entries of the matrix. You're storing every entry. And so you get N squared storage. Does this make sense? So please ask me any questions at this point. It's n squared storage for an adjacency matrix, whereas it's theta of m for a list of edges. Right? Now this becomes really important when you're storing your graph. Which way should you? There's there's another way called the adjacency list. Which, which, well, let me tell you about the adjacency list and then we can come back to this in a little. 
<coughs> okay. Is this clear? Any questions? So either you can put them in the chat or you can just, you know, unmute yourself and shout it out. So the, so this is like, okay, so the list of edges was all of like the storage is the number of edges. Mm -hmm. And then this one is the. It's the square of the number of vertices. It actually doesn't depend on the number of edges. Because even if you like, regardless of whether you have more edges or fewer edges, you still have to store a bit, either you store a zero or a one. But that's the same amount of storage. Oh, that makes sense. Okay. Right? It's not that there's a zero it doesn't mean that you don't have to store anything. You still have to store that it is a zero. It's exactly, it's a bitmap. It's one bit for each pair. Okay, that makes sense then. Like... Yeah, one bit for each pair. Okay, so adjacent, this is a list of edges. This is the raw list of edges. Adjacency matrix. And then there is maybe <clears throat> the classic representation as an adjacency list, which maybe some of you have heard of. This is just like, you know, it's almost like our hash tables. It's an array of linked lists. Okay, so essentially each neighborhood V is stored as a linked list. Remember, we assume that V, the vertex, the set of vertices is from one to N. And so your representation, which is going to look like, which should be reminiscent of a hash table with chaining, Okay, so I'm going to do something a little annoying here. I'm going to start indexing my array from one because the vertices are typically going from one to n and not from zero to n minus one. If it really bothered you, you can just put like a null at the zeroth position. And so you have this. And this is now each of these are stored as a linked list. Okay. So if, for example, the neighborhood set. So let's go back to our, uh, let's go back to <clears throat> this graph that we had at the beginning. Let me just sort of show that to you. So if you remember, I can put both of these side by side. There's the graph there, right? And so what you would have is that you would have six lists, right? You have six lists there. One, two, three, four, five, six. So the six list, that's just going to be null. List number one is going to be what? It's going to be two, three, and four. And then list number three is going to be one, and five, note that there is nothing that says this has to be in sorted order. The list of two could be five, four, and one, so on and so forth, right? So you just have a collection of lists. And so now my question is, what is the storage? And so we'll go back to our familiar choices. Is it theta of n? Is it theta of M or is it theta of M plus N? So I'll relaunch my poll. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Oh. 
Okay, so it's good. I think most of you recognize that the answer is M plus N, and this is exactly, you know, it's, it's the same argument as the hash table with chaining, right? Because you have to store N head pointers. This is N, remember. And then you're also storing something for each edge. So just to give you a flavor, of why you should pick one over the other. Let's take an example that, you know, in this day and age, we are all familiar with, which is the social network and say, okay, so let's consider a social network. All right. Uh, how many users do you think like, let's say, let's say Twitter or Facebook, how many users do you think it has? Any guesses? Anyone know? Yeah, a billion, billion is not unreasonable, a billion. And someone said it's, it's, it's 90% bots, but even 10% of a billion is a, is a hundred million. That's, that's pretty big. So why don't we start with a billion? Okay. Let's go with a billion. So we'll say N is a billion. How many edges do you think it has? So is, the way to think about this is to think of Suppose you're an average user on Twitter. How many edges do you, how many followers do you think an average user on Twitter would have? Or an average number of friends of someone on Facebook? What would be a rough ballpark? How much? Yeah, not bad. So all the answers that people are typing are, you know, they're around the right thing, like 500, 200. Uh, someone says 10, 25. Okay, so this is all within the same order of magnitude. Let's say it's about 100, just to make the numbers look nice. So we'll say, okay, it's 100 times 10 to the 9. So what is this? This is 10 to the 11. Okay. And now let's look at how much, it, how much storage you need using an adjacency list, an adjacency matrix, and an edge list. So let's just start with the edge list. Okay, and <clears throat> what's gonna happen in an edge list is you're gonna have to store each of these as a pair, right? It's gonna be, the storage is gonna be a pair of let's say, you know, it's technically they'll be like longs, okay? So let's say each edge, let's say each edge takes you know, maybe about four, four takes probably about, you know, 16 bytes. So I'm just going to round this up and say it's going to take about 20 bytes to store. Right. So the graph, the storage is going to be the number of bytes times the number of edges and 11. That's two times 10 to the 12. So how much is that? How many bytes is that? What, 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 what do you call this thing? Two times 10 to the 12, roughly. 10 to the three would be a kilobyte. 10 to the six is a megabyte. 10 to the nine is a gigabyte. And 10 to the 12 is a? Terabyte. Terabyte, terabyte, good. So you have what, two terabytes. What do you think, is that a lot? Is that a little? Well, if it's on a laptop, it's not too bad, but it's kind of big. It's not at all bad. I mean, after all, you're storing, heck, you're storing all of Twitter, right? I'm sure that they can afford that. Exactly, right? This isn't particularly big. So the edge list isn't particularly big. Now, if you look at the adjacency list, it's going to be roughly the same order of magnitude. The storage, it might be a little bit more because you have to store these pointers. Right, but the storage is going to be a little bit more. So instead of two terabytes, because here the edge list, you're just storing the list of edges. Here, you kind of have to store these pointers. Right, and you also have to store the head pointers, but the head pointers are so small, there are very few of them. Like in this case, note that N is much smaller than M. 
So the storage, you know, maybe instead of two terabytes, I'll say, you know, it's going to be at most something like four terabytes. So it's a little worse. But if you're a big tech company, then you can certainly afford that much storage. But let's look at the adjacency matrix. So the adjacency matrix. Now this is going to be something like 10 to the nine square bits. That's 10 to the 18 bits, which is roughly 10 to the 17 bytes. Right, so how much, so how many, how many terabytes was that? How many terabytes is this? <clears throat> Yeah, I know it's a lot, but I, I'm assuming you work it out. Like that? Sorry? Is it Yottabyte? Yo, I don't even, does it have a name? I know that, what, what, so it's a petabyte, then exabyte, right? So it's going to be, I guess it's, uh, what is it? It's 100,000 terabytes, right? 100,000 terabytes. Do you think anyone can afford that much storage? The NSA can probably do it. I don't know. Someone says Dell, Twitter. I don't think they have that much storage. A big company surely can. I, oh, uh, that's a lot. That's a lot. Um, I doubt that any, yeah, someone said that's less than a million laptops, but I doubt that a company is going to actually have a million laptops. That's a lot. That's a lot. So this is already beyond the scope of any. So this is already telling you. Like why adjacency lists are the most popular ways of storing graphs, even though adjacency matrices have their benefits, unless your matrix, unless the number of vertices is really small, you're not going to use an adjacency matrix. Okay. <clears throat> so given that I'm going to throw out some definitions here, I'll just say that if M is much, much smaller than N square, this is often called a sparse graph. And you store as an adjacency list. Now, if the number of edges is close to n squared, like if everything is almost an edge, then often this is called a dense graph. And you store as an adjacency matrix commonly. There are situations where dense graphs arrive. It doesn't happen in, uh, it doesn't happen at social networks, but for example, when people are looking at some kind of communication network between a small set of machines that are all talking to each other, that is stored as a dense graph. Uh, sometimes you could even look at something like trade networks, like each node is a country and an edge means there is trade. That's often, that's, well, I don't know how, it's, it's, it's often much denser and it's convenient. And there are so few countries that you store it as a, as a dense graph. So transactions where, you know, you have lots, every vertex is connected with many different vertices that's when you would use a, an adjacency matrix. Otherwise, you use an adjacency list. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> now one thing that is worth talking about is you remember that we would create these tables with operations and how long it turn takes to do the operation. So let's just sort of do that exercise. Let's just say I have a list of edges. You have an adjacency list. And you have the adjacency matrix. And I want to consider operations Okay, so, so we can look at the simplest one, which is insert edge. If 
find an edge and maybe delete edge with a pointer. Like let's say you've actually found it and then you want to delete it. Now this, these are your traditional operations, your traditional, I'll say the usual operations. Now really none of these are perfectly designed for these operations, although they're not bad for it, but these are, in some sense, this is, if you look at the adjacency list is probably, the adjacency matrix is probably the best because you can insert an edge in theta of one, you can find an edge in theta of one and you can delete the edge in theta of one. And because all you have to do is go and update it. It's a bitmap. You're storing a set as a bitmap. It's really efficient. Now on a list of edges, inserting is also, well, when even an adjacency list inserting is O of one because you're just inserting in a, in a linked list. Now finding an edge over here is just awful because you're just going to have to look through that. And of course, deleting with a pointer, if you think about it, is all over one. Now I left that entry uh, for a good reason. I'm going to give a different operation here, which is get all of NV, which is the neighborhood. What this means is I give you a vertex, give me all of its neighbors. Okay. Now the list of edges, you just have to traverse the entire list. So there's nothing to be done there. Okay. The adjacency list. Okay. So we'll come back to that. Now in the adjacency matrix, if you want to find all the neighbors of a vertex U, you have to go through that entire row of the matrix. That's going to be O of n. Now it turns out that for both these operations, for both the find and this, what you get over here is I'll write it as dv. What this, this is so, somewhat, what this means is like dv is the degree of vertex v. So when you have a vertex v, the length of its list, right, in your agency list, the length of that list. The length of the list is dv. So if the degree is large, then of course this takes more time. If the degree is less, it takes less time. The reason I parameterize it in that way is it says that you can get all of the neighborhood efficiently because there are dv neighbors and you can find all of them in dv time. So this operation is called the traversal. And traversals are really important. So in a graph, usually we're okay with having the insert, find, and delete be less efficient, but we want the traversals to be efficient because that's really what the graph is about. It's about traversing the graph. <clears throat> and that's the reason why <clears throat> you will commonly see the adjacency list is being used. Now, having said that, there are situations where people will store it just as a list of edges simply because it's easier to do other operations. Like, for example, if you have what's called a distributed computer, where you actually have to divide up your input into multiple different chunks, then dividing up a list of edges into multiple chunks is a lot easier. So it's not that people don't use a list of edges, they've actually come back as people have started doing distributed algorithms. But for the sake of this course, and usually for the sake of you know an undergrad in BS, uh, an undergrad in CS, not BS, um, although maybe uh, <clears throat> you would use an adjacency list. Okay, so with that, 